First question in that. Mindy, why cookies? <laughs> I can't begin to tell you how many times I've answered that <laughs> question. Um, why cookies? Um, well, I, I love cookies. I um, have always made cookies. When I was a little girl, I baked cookies. Um, I sort of um, fell in love with cookies because I was grounded all the time. And um, my mother allowed me to cook in the kitchen. And then um, when I was 13, she bought me a KitchenAid, of which I still have, the same KitchenAid. And I mean, I have, a, I, have a, I have a very funny story about that. So if you want me, I we'll don't have to remember yeah, the this because I have a really cute story about okay. it. I have the professional series, so it's uh, it's like metal. <laughs> I don't even know. It has no color, um, but it's a great. It, and I, so I always bake cookies. And the thing about cookies, and I know that all of you who enjoy cookies and love cookies understand that cookies are about the love that you have for other people. They're about giving. They're about um, they're about family, they're about tradition, they're about memories, they're about um, gifts, they're, they're just about, there's so many different things about cookies. We make cookies, it's the first thing we do with our children, so our children are not wild and running around the house. We, we, we teach them to calm down and bake cookies and mix the bowl and lick the bowl and roll the cookies out during Christmas. And so... That's one of the reasons why I love cookies, because I actually got into this industry to actually cook for people. It's what I wanted to do. So cookies are perfect for that. Um, I mean, it's actually gotten a lot bigger for me, a little bit more meaningful, but um, initially that's how it started. And I think that everybody feels that way about cookies. So I thought that I could connect with the masses by sharing my cookie sort of my techniques with other people. That's what I wanted to do. And I think they sort of represent like these small, manageable bites of love and wonderfulness. I mean, it doesn't have to be this huge thing. You can enjoy this high quality, small yes. thing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I call them little nuggets of love. Oh, perfect. <laughs> um, so, yeah, totally. That's or, cookies. Yeah, yeah, cookies, 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 cookies. Yeah. <laughs> so I have to say that uh, some people claim that they are not dessert people. Right here. <laughs> Monica's daughter will attest that? to that. But you tell them, those dessert haters, um, <laughs> just eat a cookie. What's the difference as a classically trained pastry chef between desserts and cookies? Well, they're, they're different. Um, when I think of a dessert being a trained pastry chef, um, in restaurants, I think of a, a plated dessert. So I think of, you know, something that's composed that has multiple different components on it. It has different textures. It has ice cream. It has a little streusel. It has what, what garnishes, fruit, whatever, whatever it is. And it's um, sort of like an art piece. Um, and not that a cookie is not an art piece, because it totally is. Mm -hmm. But um, cookie is like baking. It's, it's, a, it's, it's something that you bake. So it's very different from a pastry. Pastry is sort of like, um, am, I, am I making, am I answering the right question? Yeah, I feel like I'm yeah, not making yeah, no, that no. clear. But yeah, so pastry and baking are very different. And because you've said before too that you don't want to do desserts anymore, that you are I don't, yeah, done plated, desserts. plated desserts. I, yeah. It's and not that I don't, and mm -hmm. I still get to do plated desserts. Mm -hmm. And I still, when I get asked to do events and I get to do the dessert, um, that's really exciting for me because I don't really make plated desserts on a daily basis anymore because I have a pastry chef in my restaurant. Um, but to me, it's so much more exciting to hone in on the little details of my craft, which is cookies and pies and cakes and bread and breakfast pastries and laminated dough. And so for me, I like to focus on one thing. And for the past, I don't know how many years, I've been focusing on cookies. Um, but I'm... My whole I the whole idea of the single subject cookbook was that I wanted to write a series of them. Mm -hmm. So oh. I do like pies and I do yeah. like cakes. So, yeah. so it's so, not just cookies, exactly. but I, I cookies are my uh, besides my husband and my dog are my true love. <laughs> so we can expect pie love and cake love to be coming out uh, to a. Um, I I have a feeling that the next book is going to be something 
very interesting with pies, but I do not want to reveal anymore. Let's, let's right. just keep the mystery. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so we're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, sometimes people can be like a cookie. They can have a sort of crisp, hard <laughs> exterior, but then a very soft, nougaty interior. And I think a lot of people think of you as... A bitch? <laughs> no. <laughs> Say that. But oh, it's they, okay. Go they ahead. But think, you know, like <laughs> be honest. Like, like a jean vest and the tattoos, and you know, a tough lady who can run her own restaurant. That you wouldn't be as sensitive and loving and and vulnerable as as really we learned you were in a recent piece by my good friend Chris Borelli. Yes, I'm and, sure no no one read it. So well, they if, don't if know you what didn't I'm read about. it. Um, <laughs> Mindy, yeah. Mindy talked about um, you know having some 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 serious I let it issues. All, I let it all hang out. Yeah. yeah. And so while you were doing yeah. this book, you know, you went through some tough times. Can you talk yeah. about it? Well, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I sure I'll talk about it, but I think I'm going to be a little general first. Okay. I yeah. think that um, people that are sitting in the room ha are from all walks of life, and I think that for creative people um, to constantly create and be relevant and to be current um, is very, very stressful. And it takes a lot out on you, especially when, you know, it's very easy to be the chef of a restaurant. It's very, very easy to be the baker of a great, um, you know, catering company or pastry shop um, or a pastry chef of a restaurant. It's very easy to do that because all you're doing is focusing on your craft. You don't have to worry about all the other aspects of the of this world that we live in. But when you own your own business, and it doesn't have to be a restaurant. It could be a clothing store. It could be a law firm. It could be a doctor's office. It doesn't really matter. When you own your own business, you're responsible. You're responsible for the people that come into your restaurant. Well, let's talk about a restaurant, come into your restaurant. But you're also responsible for your employees. Mm -hmm. And it's an enormous amount of pressure. And... Um, my whole life, I wanted to own my own business. I just, I used to play restaurant with my brother. And, you know, um, we invented the Food Network because when we were little in the 70s, we used to look up at the monitor in the corner and we were always cooking for somebody with our little fake dishes and our fake food. But, um, you know, I always wanted to have that ownership and I had no idea what it meant. Hmm. And it was so interesting and so... You know, that saying that the more you think you know, the less you know is so true. Yeah. And it's a very humbling experience. But it's also, you, it gives you a lot of pressure. And I think that I was, in the beginning of owning my restaurant, I was very, very hard on my staff. I screamed a lot. Um, I was very uptight. I mean, my parents worked in my restaurant. And I remember, like, year, you know, like the first couple of years that my parents my mother coming out of the office when I was screaming and my father coming out, you know, from the dining room and like taking me aside and being like, you have to be quiet. And they were like yelling at me and like, you know, yelling at me. And I'm like, I can't be quiet. I'm so angry, you know, but, um, you know, they're not doing their job. They're not cracking eggs the right way. And it's just like, you know, I think as you get older and you get more mature, you let go of a lot of things and, you accept people for who they are. And you also not only accept people for who they are, but you also realize the value of people mm -hmm. and relationships. And you cherish that. And, you know, my staff is very important to me now. And I have learned a lot. But with learning a lot, you still have a reputation. And um, it's not true. <laughs> a lie. <laughs> so no, specifically yeah. though also when you were working on this book I mean we see this now and it's beautiful and it seems to be like that sort of the perfect culmination at a point in your career where you're like okay you know like we we're saying this is your first book you're finally really ready to do it it should have been the best time of your life right and it was not yeah <laughs> it was the worst that. time of my what life <clears throat> well um you know I was working in my restaurant and also writing a book which is very very hard to do and, um, you know, trying to, you know, make the right context in, context or in the book. And that's very difficult because 
when you write a book, you want the book to be cohesive. And so you want it to make sense. You want it to come full circle. And which is interesting that I say, I'm saying that because I think that I came full circle writing the book. And, you know, I had just gotten married. I signed a lease on a bakery because for some reason I had it in my mind that I was going to open a bakery. And not only was I going to open a bakery, but I was going to open up a 6,000 square foot bakery. Wow. Okay. And, you know, bridges over Madison County, Clint Eastwood says something really great. He says, the old <laughs> dreams were good dreams. I'm glad I had them. And, you know, I said to myself, I'm glad that I've always wanted to open a bakery. I'm really glad, but I'm not going to do it. And I decided to just not do it. Which was a brave move. This was <clears> going <throat> to be in Logan Square, you know, that, that hot block where everything is going to... I was personally disappointed because it would have been close yeah, to me. Yeah, highly but anticipated. Yeah. yeah. And it was really pretty brave that you'd said, I'm, I'm not going to do it. I need yeah. to scale down. Yeah. So, and, I, you know, I, so I was writing a book. I was re opening a bakery. <clears throat> I had just gotten married. And I made a comment to somebody, and I said... My business comes before my husband. And I remember saying it, and I said it, and I said it in front of my husband. And <laughs> You're still married? Yes. And I remember, like, then reflecting on it and, like, thinking about it. And I was like, wait a second. No, my husband comes first. And my relationship and my life and yeah. me, I come first. And I think it was like the first time that I had said it. And I just, I, I think at that point, I, I think it was one of those epiphanies in my life where I decided that I was going to make better decisions about my career. And I wasn't going to continue, you know, because it was like, why do I, you know, we were talking about this backstage. It's like, you know, you think like, I have to be relevant. I have to be the best. I have to be this. I have to come up with the best dessert. I have to come up with the cronut. I have to do all these things, you know, the best chocolate chip cookie. Everything has to be this, 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 you know. And then it's like, well, what happens if it's not? It's okay. It's totally okay. I still have a life. I still have friends. I still have a business. I still have a James Beard Award. I still have people that... I <laughs> right? Right? You know, but it's like I still have things in my life that make up me that aren't just the chef, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and um, I have great friends, you know, I have a, the, the cutest dog in the world, you know, I have great fa parents, um, I have great staff, you know, it's like all these things, it's like, then you say, okay, it's okay, it's okay, you know, and now the book comes out and it's like, then I have to, you know, then I have to write another okay, book yeah. and, you know, mm -hmm. then it gets to be a different thing, but, um, it's okay to slow down. Mm -hmm. It's really okay. Yeah. And you were sharing with us, as you were saying backstage, that uh, actually when you were baking and photographing, the cookies was the lowest the point book. of my life. Yeah. And the and, lowest point of my life. You did share this also in the articles. So yeah. Not, no, it's cool. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm so an open book. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, so what happened at that? <clears throat> well, point? I just I. Um, yeah, I, you know, you guys probably all figured out. I was just going to tell you all about the recipes in the book, and I now we'll get I'm back to that. About... We will for sure. <laughs> um, no, I, I, um, I, I was extremely depressed, but I was physically depressed. It wasn't like a like a depression, like oh poor me. It was like really serious, mm -hmm. and um, I felt it getting like I could not control it, and so I um, went on medication. And it was the first time, and I'm 47, so it was like I it was the first time that I realized that maybe I should be on medication. And, you know, it was really the best decision that I ever made because I am not depressed anymore, and I'm really happy, and I'm a much different person. Yes. Yay. I'm a much different person, and, you know, I feel like I, I handle things better. And I don't know if it's because I'm taking a little blue pill, but um, it's made me a better person. And... I'm sure that that message can touch a lot of people and probably yeah. already did from the article. For sure. That, you know, you can get so caught up in work or other things that you forget to value the relationships and the things that are the bedrock of your life. Um, yes. Which reminds me of sure chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, everybody has their idea of what the perfect chocolate chip cookie that their mom made for them was. 
how have you dealt with the expectations of a great chocolate chip right. cookie? The, the biggest pressure of writing the book was making sure that the chocolate chip cookie was right because the measure of a great pastry chef or a great cookie book is chocolate chip cookie. And, um, but I, you know, everyone has their own criteria. Um, I worked at a restaurant called Marche that is not around anymore. And I was lucky enough to work with a gentleman. His name is Tom Powers. And he um, was the manager. And the, like my first week that I was there, he came up to me and had this whole like conversation about the criteria for a perfect chocolate chip cookie. And he gave me the list. And it was like salt, vanilla, ratio of brown sugar to granulated sugar, the chocolate that you use, the crispiness on the outside, and then the chewiness on the inside. And it was like all these different things, and it like blew my mind. And it was like all I did was work on chocolate chip cookies for like a couple of weeks. And I still work on it. I mean, I don't, you know, I, th I think that... The recipe's never finished. <clears throat> the recipe's never <laughs> finished, you know. It's like that pursuit of excellence. You're never reaching excellence. Because you, once you get there, you got to keep pushing yourself. You stop beating up on yourself, Mindy. I'm it's sure the chocolate really, cookies really hard. hard. No, I mean, it's just, you know, that's the thing. It's like, you know, so I said okay to the, the not having the, the bakery, but now it's like the perfect chocolate chip yeah. cookie. I got to still strive to have, you know, it's like So chewy? Type A Should, it, should it be a little yeah. chewy and still yeah, crispy, crispy when it's cool? Yeah, yeah. And you had that nice little salt, the crunchy little salt. Little salt, yeah. yeah. Perfect chocolate. You know, I make chocolate chip cookies in multiple different ways. So I came up with the technique that you melt the chocolate on a sheet pan and then you freeze it and then you fold it into the dough what? so that when you bake it, you get like these ribbons of chocolate and then oh. they're like these little crispy little thin layers. Oh. Really good. But I also love beautiful coins. Yeah. I personally have found that 53% cho milk chocolate makes the best chocolate chips. But I am a milk chocolate, caramel, butterscotch, malt, port, porter, stout um, <laughs> kind of girl. Yeah. Smoked almonds. Right. Those okay. are my flavors. There's Bananas. Deep, rich, yeah, the deep, flavors. rich, those yeah. kind of like hues are like mm -hmm. what I like. Okay. I still like lemon. Mm -hmm. I still like citrus. I still like all that. But um, so like sour milk chocolate is like I can't you get enough so of it. So you don't that. want like, mm -hmm. okay. Can't get enough of it. I do like bittersweet, but I, I like it in certain things. So I'm. So 53. Yeah, I like that. It's a newer kind of chocolate. So. Mm. So Cho is actually. Cho is, is, is it's an American chocolate. Right. They're pro the beans are processed uh -huh. in San Francisco, and they get their milk solids from Humboldt County, mm -hmm. and they're sour. Mm -hmm. um, and sour like a dark chocolate? Or? No, no. Yeah, well, a little bit. Yes. Yeah. You know how like. Dark chocolate's fruity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and rich. Okay. And milk chocolate is milky and smooth. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes milk chocolate can be too sweet. Yeah. This milk chocolate's actually bitter, but it's mm. milky in the finish. Mm -hmm. Okay. You just got to put it on your tongue yeah. and let it dissolve. We got to try <laughs> Mindy's cookies. <laughs> I think that that's a perfect example of you being a self-described cookie nerd. I, um, yeah, well. But you're not a snob <laughs> since you admit eating whole bags of store bought Milano's. Love and Milano's. Chips Ahoy cookies. Chips Ahoy. Is the, yeah. yeah, those are great. And those are crispy chocolate chip cookies. Yeah. They're I, not chewy. They're, they're not, not chewy, but if you yeah. dunk them in milk, oh. they get soft. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> See, and they're, everyone's laughing because they know what I'm talking about. Exactly. Oh, totally. Yeah. And I am the dessert lover up here too because I mean I we were talking about this I get the dessert menu first at dinner so I know I can plan backwards because we're saying it's like you can't doggy bag ice cream you know and if it's Mindy's ice creams and desserts you know so but there is a lot of health backlash so the World Health Organization recently called on reducing sugar intakes there's even a hashtag dessert worthy campaign so what yeah. do you say about but that? But that, that dessert worthy campaign is by Emily Lucchetti exactly who is a pastry chef yeah and what she's saying is use unprocessed products in your baking, use unrefined sugars, and use quality products. Use fresh milk flour, use whole wheat flour, use graham flour. So she's, and use fresh eggs, you know, from the farmer's market. She's not, they're not saying don't eat sweets. They're saying choose products that are quality. And I agree with that 100%. And, you know, I, the first 
couple days that my book was out, I went on Amazon quickly to see how many people loved my book. <laughs> and some people did not love my book. Wow. And, you know, I was like, what? Right. And, you know, and it, w it was because, you know, people actually have to go to the store and actually buy ingredients or yeah, go right. online and buy quality ingredients. And you don't have to. If you want to use Toll House chips, go right ahead. I don't really care. But use my recipe. But the whole idea of the book is that these are 60 cookies that are making ordinary extraordinary. And why wouldn't you want to make your food extraordinary? Why wouldn't you want to go to f Yeah, right? right? Exactly. I, mean, I don't get it. I mean, well, you should. You know, Louisa accuses me of hating desserts. I just am picky. I want, I want them to be high quality. I want everything right. that I put into my body to not be shitty food. Um, sorry, so there are kids in the audience. Um, <laughs> And, Everybody knows. And, and so that, that brings me, so you do have specific standards for what you'd like to be put in. Can you talk about, you've talked about chocolate, vanilla. What, what is your go-to vanilla where you really want, or is it vanilla beans? Do well, beans I, um, <clears throat> actually, um, vanilla extract, we buy in big containers, and we do buy very high quality. I'm not, I, it, it doesn't really matter, um, the vanilla extract, mm -hmm. but, um, we, I mean, obviously, I would prefer Tahitian vanilla beans mm -hmm. over Madagascar, but Madagascar well, are just fine <laughs> because what we do is we, I, we have everybody that works in pastry has a ball jar of vanilla beans that are soaked in vanilla extract. Mm -hmm. And um, so they've been soaking for days, you know, however long. I mean, we go through a ton of vanilla, vanilla beans, so... Um, so they're very plump and they're very, very juicy. Mm. Um, I didn't know they're supposed to be juicy. Yeah, they're beautiful. I, I've been bad ones. Okay. Yeah, no, 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 no. Well, if, you, if they're dry, you yeah. could take them. If they're super, yeah, super them. dry, they're, they have just dried out. Yeah. And um, you can either reconstitute them in the vanilla extract or you can take them and grind them into sugar, uh, in the sugar, and okay. then you make vanilla sugar. Yeah. And so that's just fine. I don't use vanilla paste because I actually tangibly like to the bean itself, and I like to, I utilize the bean, and I utilize the seeds, and so um, we do that, and a lot of times I'll take the beans after I've taken the, I've taken the, the pot after I've taken the seeds out, and we'll take them and we'll put them like in bourbon, or we'll put them in brandy, um, just to like flavor our alcohol. Nice. But um, I am a huge advocate of fresh milled flour. Okay. Um, I think there's a major difference. And Where do you get it? Where can the consumers well, get it? Well, I mean, you can get it at um, the Green City Market. Um, you can get it online. But oddly enough, <clears throat> oddly enough, and this is absolutely crazy because it's actually scary to me, is that um, I love this type of um, flower. It's called Red Fife. And um, I actually saw Red Fife, Fife flower being sold in Whole Foods. And it actually scared me because it's supposed to be this ancient grain and, you know, you're only supposed to get it from your farmer and now it's in Whole Foods. And once it's in Whole Foods, it's going commercial and then you're going to find it in Mariano's and then you're going to find it everywhere and then it's going to be processed. And, it and won't then be they're going to actually ruin the grain. And, you know, uh, so um, that concerns me. Get but it while it's good. Don't tell anybody. Four gets yeah. into Mariano's. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah. Um, Don't tell anybody. You know, I, uh, you know, we, I... There is this gentleman, his name is Roderick Marcus, and he owns a um, company called Rare Tea Cellars. But he has all these very, he's, he's huge in my book because he has a showroom in, um, in Ravenswood, and you can go into a showroom, and it's just aisles and aisles of really great ingredients. And I, it's, I'm, I get an enormous amount of inspiration from him. And go on his website, you can find such cool Yeah, I mean, stuff. you can get anything from him. Rare and, Tea uh, Cellars. You know, he. I discovered, you know, bourbon, the bourbon, the bourbon barrel aged sugar, smoked sugar that he carries, and the um, violet sugar that he gets, like, from France. Wow. I mean, he just has really great ingredients. So, um, <clears throat> you know, I think that's, <clears throat> I think that's just really cool. And so ingredients I, matter in the, out, in the final product. I think ingredients matter, and I think the butter matters and I think that the eggs matter and I think that, yeah, I think everything matters. Yeah, totally. I do. Because wouldn't you rather eat a piece of steak that you knew were the farmer mm -hmm. who killed it or who humanely, you know, processed the steak? Wouldn't you rather know where Absolutely. you got it from? 
and the yeah. chickens and the and the fish. Wouldn't you rather know that it was like you know fished in sustainable waters? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with 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 pastry. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't necessarily connect that with pastry, but it's interesting it they don't. Yeah, because that's why you eat strawberries in the end of spring, beginning of summer. And you only get strawberries for two weeks because that's the only growing season <laughs> Michigan has is yeah. two weeks. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you just you eat different. with the seasons. They're, they taste different. They taste them. differently. Yeah. They definitely do. So going back to something that you said earlier, talking about ingredients and also technique um, and eggs, what, what was the right way to crack eggs in your head before? <laughs> and like, why well, doesn't it matter how, you know? <laughs> You know, I mean, there. You know, I. You know, everyone's got their own technique for cracking and eggs. And we fight about it. Well, I, I. First of all, I don't understand why people crack an egg like with one hand and put it over your hand like Show that off. because then you're. Well, but then the yolk is. What happens if the yolk breaks? Right. Yeah. You know, and then I know that there's some pastry yeah, chefs you need to that separate. are. Yeah, I'm. Yeah. I know there are some pastry chefs that are very anal and they um, crack the egg. I, I mean, I have a girl that's been working for me for years, and she cracks all her eggs in a bowl, and then she picks up the yolks and takes them out and set one at a time. And it's just like, I mean, I want to sit there all day and, like, just watch her. You know, it's like, you know, I can crack 96 eggs or 100 yolks. I can separate 100 yolks, like, in less than five minutes. Wow, liquid. by hand. Yeah. So you don't use one of the... Okay, so do you crack them on the flat yeah, counter so or the on the edge of the counter? I crack them on one of my employees' heads. <laughs> and you got to have an employee around all the time. Yeah. So maybe their reputation wasn't wrong. No, 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 no. I crack it on the table. Uh -huh. It depends. Table. Sometimes edge, I do edge. it on the table. Sometimes I do it, you know, sometimes we just, you know, do, 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 do. We just crack it everywhere, you know. <laughs> have fun. <laughs> there you go. There, what yeah. works. And clearly if this person's been working for you for years and she does it that way. That's the okay, way she does exactly. it and I leave her alone. Yeah. And if it yeah. works. Yeah. There's very <laughs> few words that are exchanged between me and her. Most of it she doesn't speak English, but it's fine. <laughs> we have a very good relationship. It's very, like, we understand each other. Um, Mindy, you share in your book that you're dyslexic. And yes. And the more chefs, and especially really talented chefs I talk to, the more I find that they are dyslexic, and many of them didn't even know when they were young. What do you think it is about dyslexia that can drive someone to, into such a creative field? Um, you know, I, I, I don't know the connection of dyslexia and creativity. All I know is that I hid behind my creativity because I couldn't excel in school. And so for me, um, I could, like, you know how you say, like, you know, a blind person can hear better than most people. Superpowers. Yeah, right. superpowers. <laughs> it's like, like, so for me, it's like, I can't read and I definitely cannot add. So, or, and I can't dial a phone number. So, <laughs> oh, it's so, not very fun. Yeah, no, on. she knows. No, I know that. Friends. I recognize that exactly. laugh. Those um, are your friends out there. <laughs> That's right. Brooke. She works for me. Friends like um, that. Yeah. <laughs> she has to dial my numbers. Um, but, um, no, I mean, it's actually, it's funny, but it's it's actually not funny no, because if right. I have to dial a number, it's like the, the numbers go like this to yeah. me and they're like, I can't, it takes me right. like three times to dial a phone number. But, um, but I can look at something and I can see what the, what the thing looks like and I can recreate it mm -hmm. because I know it. And, you know, it's like, and honestly, like my brother, he has perfect pitch. So he can hear a song and then he can play it on the piano. Huh. I mean, I couldn't do that, yeah. but he can. And, you know, I just think that some people have some talent, you know, we all have something inside of us, and sometimes we find it, and sometimes we don't. I'm glad I was dyslexic. I found my niche, and that I was grounded all the time. Because <laughs> yeah. I was a really bad kid in high school. It was terrible. Well, so. thank goodness for that. As yeah, I mean, us, I guess. You know? I, mean, should, you know, I got it out of my system. I'm super square now. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> oh, you don't believe so. me. That's what I am. Very so, square. So we especially appreciate that overcoming that kind of adversity for this book, but also the restaurant. Because, I mean, I think it's kind of funny that you say being a chef is easy. I mean, like, who says that? No one says that, you know? I mean, but also you've got what seems to be sort of like the two strikes against you, being a woman and a pastry chef who owns a restaurant. 
usually a lot of restaurants don't even have pastry chefs anymore. True. I mean, so talk about creating that whole experience coming from your perspective. You know, I mean, being... Well, it's pretty food. awesome, don't you think? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I wanted exactly. to open up a yeah. restaurant. I wanted to open up a restaurant that um, was through the eyes of a pastry chef. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily having dessert first, because I think right. that's completely wrong. Sorry, I think yeah. it's wrong. Uh -huh. But, because uh -huh. um, <clears throat> no, I, 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 I really, I, I absolutely right. respect progression um, mm -hmm. of food. But I, I wanted to have a restaurant that we thought and conceived of the pastry first, and then we thought, like, what was the food that would actually get you to order dessert? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, my restaurant has evolved so much since then, since that original concept. I mean, yeah. now, you know, now I actually have a woman chef, and she's yes. a phenomenal cook. And, you know, now I, we sort of, I mean, we don't have our own agenda, but we, I mean, part of being a pastry chef, the most exciting thing about being a pastry chef when you are one in a restaurant is that you get to create the desserts after the food. So you're the, like the lasting impression. Um, I like to say you're like that period or exclamation point or question mark. I'm not sure. <laughs> Whichever one Ellipses. you choose. Oh, right, I mean, yeah. I prefer an exclamation point as yeah. opposed to a question mark. That's why I make desserts that are identifiable to human beings. Um, but um, I, you know, I, you know, you want to like, it, it, it's exciting. I love creating desserts after food. Like I love to see, it inspires me. So, you know, but I wanted to have my own restaurant. I, I wanted to. And when I was thinking of, you know, I really wanted to be honest with you, I really wanted to open up a luncheonette. Um, it, you know, I opened up my restaurant around the time that I loved, used to go to Leo's lunchroom all the time. Aww. And I loved that restaurant. Yeah. Remember? And there, you know, I just loved that place. Mm -hmm. There was a place in Wicker Park that, um, was around and it's not around anymore, obviously, but it was called Gimo's. Do you remember that place? Yeah. And I loved it. I loved that kind of like environment. Describe and I, with that luncheonette, <clears throat> like the yeah. 10 years ago, young, angry, Mindy, what were you thinking? You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean. you know no, but I, I wanted, I, that's what I really wanted, but I just didn't think that I knew anything about that. So uh -huh. what I really knew was, was you know, plated desserts. So I knew that fine I was going to have to open up a place, yeah, and, mm -hmm. and fine dining, yeah. you know, or what I thought was fine dining. Uh -huh. I mean, fine dining has changed so much in the past 10 years. I mean, there, you know, it's just, it's, I mean, I, I don't even know how to describe fine dining anymore. I don't even know how to describe eating anymore. I don't even know how we eat. I mean, it's just the strangest <laughs> thing. I mean, we go to restaurants and we get these little plates and then we eat like 30 of them and then we leave and we're hungry. I just, you know, I mean, like I, I didn't grow up like that. You know, I grew up with like, you know, you had soup or salad and you had an entree and it had like a starch and a vegetable and then you had dessert. I just, you know, so it was like, it's very weird. All this dining thing is just, it's like, you know, I'm confused, but, um, you know, yeah. But, but having said that, I mean, you do have some pretty, you know, adventurous flavors that you go into too. I mean, like you were talking about like the lavender and yeah, I don't I mean, think even that's adventurous. You know, but I mean, maybe but in the I context, don't. Yeah, exactly. But in the context, even with like some of the <clears> more <throat> traditional, like your Eastern European roots, and you know, I'm sure your grandma, the rogala, and the exactly. Kolachki. They didn't exactly. make you mean they didn't make raspberry rose rose um, jam. And, I don't know. No. Did they? Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. No. Yeah. So no. tell yeah, tell us a little bit about you know you were sort of sharing a little bit insight about your personal connection yeah. to some of these recipes. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, well, for me, um, my food is very personal, mm -hmm. whether it's personal to me or it's personal to someone that I know, or it's sort of like, um, or it's something that I think could be personal to somebody else. Like I never picked rhubarb with my grandmother, mm -hmm. but I know somebody here in this room did. I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, and somebody here, like my husband, his parents um, bought a house in Piatone and their neighbors brought them this thing, oh, they, they were unpacking, and they looked outside the window, and they saw one of their neighbors planting rhubarb in their mm. front lawn, and he's like, you know, it's a tradition, you, you plant rhubarb in somebody's house, <laughs> and, <laughs> um, you know, and or now, you vandalize yeah, it. and yeah, now they, 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 they yeah. all have, I, I don't remember, there is a story, there, it's, a, it's a tradition in some, it's a pitone thing, right, yeah, I don't know what it is, but I'm sure somebody here might know, uh -huh. but, um, you know, so they, like, they always have rhubarb, and so, like, it always reminds me of my mother-in-law. But 
you know, so like for me, like I, you know, when I was a little girl, I used to sleep at my, my grandparents' house and, and they lived in the city. We lived in the suburbs and <clears throat> my brother and I would get in our pajamas and we'd put our robes on with my grandfather, my papa, and we would sit at the table and we would have, and it was like, you know, it was still like, like getting dark and it was time for us to go to sleep. And my grandmother would f put bowls of blueberries, sour cream and brown sugar in front of us. And so for me, I remember this. And like, so when I think of blueberries, I think of like blueberries, brown sugar, and sour cream. How could anyone not know that, you know? Mm -hmm. Like that's what I think of, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, so everybody, so like, so I, that is how I cook. I cook with um, memories and emotion. Mm -hmm. And for me, because for me, I want people to leave my restaurant and I'm hoping and I hope it happens but it doesn't happen all the time that they leave happy and they leave satisfied and they leave feeling like they it it took them back somewhere you mm -hmm. know and you know and it, it is interesting because we um my my pastry chef Kelsey and I have designed the menu pastry menu now where we do these collections so they change every like couple of weeks they change like every couple months and the, the one that we're doing now is nostalgia through spring flavors, but they're nostalgic desserts. And how we came up with the desserts is we had conversations with the people in the kitchen and everyone told a story about their childhood. Mm -hmm. And we created desserts through these stories. Mm -hmm. And one of my sous chef was telling us how his mother used to always make this box cheesecake jello cake. Uh -huh. So we have a yeah. cheesecake jello cake on the huh. menu. And it's like, you know, my father was a soda jerk, so we have a, a soda on the menu. He was a soda jerk when he was little. So it's like, you know, all these memories are, and I think that's what food should be about. Yeah. To me, that's what food is. So when you, when you have a memory like that, very specifically, we can all imagine, you know, that like really warm, sultry Chicago night when young baby Mindy <laughs> practically was uh, having that. How does that translate then to like a dessert that you either did as a plated dessert or did as a... A, you know, like one of your arugula. I mean, how, what do you what what does that memory become? That well, we end up I'll, I'll tell you a story, and I don't know if it's related to what you're asking, but it's a very much very <laughs> similar. But it's yeah, very yeah. similar. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I went to Italy yeah. um, a couple of years ago for my husband's. Now my husband, he wasn't then. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, his best fr for um, Lincoln's wedding, and he got married in a villa in Italy. And it was only 26 of us, so we were very intimate with each other. We got very close. And one of the girls was getting married, and she asked me to make her wedding cake, and she's like, I really want red velvet cake. And I, I like, I mean, red velvet cake is not a good cake. It's just, <laughs> it, it's just honestly, it's Mostly not. food coloring? It's food coloring, and it's just, what, I mean, what is it? I mean, it, I don't even know. Uh -huh. And so I was like, well, I mean, I'm, I'm going to have to make her red velvet cake, but I have to rethink this. I got to rethink this. So I started thinking and thinking and overthinking and thinking. I mean, like it was out of my mind. Yeah. And so I came up with this idea that you could take, because it was in September, yeah. that I had all these turned raspberries. And I was like, I'm going to take these raspberries and I'm going to take framboise. Mm. And I'm going to cook the two down. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to make a paste. It's going to be this raspberry framboise paste. Mm -hmm. And this is what I'm going to flavor the red velvet cake with. Okay. And I yeah. did. Uh -huh. And so it's a red velvet cake, but it's actually a raspberry framboise cake. So you, cake. you yeah. folded it into the cake batter? Yeah. Well, I made like almost like classic red velvet cake, but instead of using red food coloring, I used right. this raspberry paste. Uh huh. And it so didn't it weigh it down? No. Wow. No, no, no. no so, no, no, but no. with. Somebody asks that for a wedding cake. They've got like a really strong idea of what, like you were saying, memory. So how does she receive it? She's expecting red velvet cake, the classic. She got red velvet cake. She got red yeah. velvet and cake. She, she got raspberry it. friend. No, red velvet cake. But like, what was her reaction when she bit into that? You know, her what? What was her reaction? I mean, she loved it. Yeah. She ended up working for me for like two years. Wow. She's badass. Yeah. <laughs> She's That's a great, serious great woman. love story. I mean, I love her. Yeah, she's awesome. You know, Louise and I were going to do a, a whole um, episode on nostalgia because I think it does really color your your feelings, your attitude, your memories, and even your taste buds around food. I mean, so much of our right, of, you know, food life is. About it's really that. this is the. I'll, I'll tell you a, a funny. I'll tell you another. I'll tell you another funny story. So um, I have a very dear friend who's in the industry. He lives in San Francisco, and we were talking. I had chess pie on my menu. It was like this lemon chess pie. Chess I don't even pie remember. Is what? Well, I will tell you yeah. what chess pie is. Okay. okay? Yeah. Because, Just hold your horses, But this Louisa. is a really, no. no, this is a really cute <laughs> yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. So he told, he said to me, 
do you know how chess pie came to be chess pie? And I was like, no, I don't, so tell me. And he's like, well, there in the in the like the 1940s, there was this family from the north, and they they were traveling to the south, and they went into a diner, and they had pie, and they went up to their they were the server said, how do you like your pie? And they were like, it's delicious. What is it? And she said, oh, honey, it's chess pie. Oh. <laughs> and so the people from the north went back home and made chess pie. But what was it really? It was, it was just, just I mean, it was just pie. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> oh, honey, it's just pie. But I, I thought it was a really, I mean, I'm sure that's not true. Yeah. But um, <laughs> I thought that was a really cute story. But well, chess pie is like this buttermilk flavors. cornmeal right. it's like concoction, a custard pie. like a custard yeah, pie, yeah. 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 Um, so, Mindy, I ran into my old colleague, Jim Derogatis, in the lunchroom at BZ today. And he said, what are you doing tonight? Because he's got this uh, breakfast club 30th or whatever, yes. 20th anniversary. Yes. I said, well, I'm not going because I'm talking to Mindy Siegel tonight. <laughs> and he said, oh, she's a big music fan. You've got to ask her about music. So, music, you grew up with it. You yeah. like to listen to it I, in I the did. kitchen. Um, well, we don't. How I'm going to tell you something, and I did not tell you this oh. in the, it, backstage. But I do not allow my staff to listen you to music. You love it, but you although, don't allow it. Although they do listen, to, and there's a reason why I don't let them listen to music. Yeah. Because as soon as they put music on, I start singing, and then it's all, all everything's over. Because, <laughs> because I start, start singing, and I start what? singing, and I start dancing, and it's done. Forget about it. But um, my father, um, it was a jazz musician in the 50s, and he played the upright bass, and so I grew up with jazz in our house. My father, my brother played the piano, and um, I met Count Basie when I was a little girl. I saw, saw him numerous times. I Latin jazz was very big. We used to go to Rick's, um, the jazz cafe. We went to the um, we went to jazz so showcase. I mean, we, I used to go hear jazz all the time. All the guys I dated were musicians. Uh -oh. um, yeah, in high school. Yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I was really into music, but I like all different types of music, and not just jazz. Um, and I have been known to travel across the country to see a great wow. band. You like stoner metal? Like well, I do, and I, I, in particular, I used to, I used to absolutely live and die for Queens of the Stone Age, and every yeah. single, yeah. <laughs> and every single like offshoot band. I mean, because I can now tell you that they they used to be Caius, and then they were Queens of the Stone Age, nice. and all these other bands. And so I'm real Mark Lanigan, like really into like all that music, and I used to go see them all the time. And so you're not so. one of those people who goes to Kumas and is like turn no, off no, no, the no, 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 noise. No, 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 I, I, I don't go to Kumas because I when things are so I don't when things are it's so it's a hamburger place that yeah. plays death metal. But when the whole things time. are so in your face, I kind of think like it's Too like much. not cool. Oh. Even though I love Kumas, I mean I've been there multiple times. It's just like <laughs> it's a little loud for me. Although I've been to Schwa for dinner and I've oh, walked right. in and the decibel of the music was so high that I couldn't. I, a dog would be but like, yeah. But that's more I mean, like, you know, gangster hip hop than than the. Well, you no, know, he he. When I was there the night I was there, he was playing Slayer at an octave that oh, like nice. you could see the music coming out of the stereo. <laughs> <laughs> it was so loud, and it was just like awful. And I love Slayer, but you know, I also love Ella Fitzgerald, yeah. and you know, Which I, I mean, I love Neil Diamond, room. and yeah. I mean, like I like Pitch Perfect is one of my favorite movies. I mean, we sing, yeah. My daughters right, too. You know, so what should be played in the dining uh, room? Excuse me, no, wait, sorry. What should be played? <laughs> What, what do should, we play in the music? What dining should you room? play in the dining room for, well, for maximum enjoyment? You know, I mean, like, <laughs> I, I have to tell you, I mean, like Led Zeppelin. We we used to have every Sunday night. We used to say it was like stoner rock music, and we used to play like um, Black Sabbath. We used to have like a Black Sabbath night. The, <laughs> all we would play is Black Sabbath. Um, but you know, if you think about it, Black Sabbath is very jazzy. Mm. If you think about it. For those of you, yeah, it's it's jazzy. It's got a little, but but there's some like little jazzy I'm riffs take under it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, back to food, Louisa. Well, yeah. bringing those together, actually, you have the ba Black Sabbath cookie. I do have the Black yeah. Sabbath cookie because oh, nice I still day. have a tablespoon of heavy metal in me. So I'm very square what, now. What is but the Black Sabbath cookie? Exactly, you, it's you an Oreo. Describe, you no, just can't no, say no, an no, Oreo. Can't. So, oh, right. so as yeah. I like to say, please describe it for us in loving detail. Oh, the the Black Sabbath cookie. Yeah. Well, it's um, it's 
it's a sandwich cookie that I make with um, noir cocoa. Mm. Yeah, which is like black cocoa. So it creates a cookie that resembles an Oreo. And um, I, the, the filling that I use with it is I take sort of like a cream cheese frosting and um, I put a little white chocolate in it and then I grind um, star, like starlight mints. Oh, right. And then yeah. I put it into the yeah, cookie. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, That's a um, great combo. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So the bitters, the bitter of the cocoa and that, that, that texture mm -hmm. yeah. of the shortbread and then the creaminess of the, um, the frosting and the mintiness mm -hmm. is very good. And then we sort of like make like a white chocolate brittle, which is reminiscent of Fannie Mae candies because, you mm -hmm. know, when you go to Fannie Mae, they would have those little uh, mint, white chocolate mint peppermint candies. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah. so we make them from scratch yeah. and then we grind them and then we, we make, we put them on the cookie. Yeah. Um, it's a delicious cookie. So, yeah. so those, uh, so that fine dining training doesn't uh, fall too far from the cookie tree there. So, yeah. Mindy and I actually had a chance to go to the Maple Syrup Festival this year recently. And it was beautiful. fascinating. Yeah, Just it's beautiful. gorgeous down in Southern India. A, of ours, a friend of ours who has that. And it was fascinating, kind of going back a little bit to um, your rocker chick, uh, tough rocker chick uh, personality. Was It was fascinating watching you interact with my dogs. I know you love your dog, Bill Burroughs. Um, <laughs> and... Um, see pictures of him on your Facebook all the time. Yes. And it was fascinating because we hadn't really had a chance to talk. No, much, it's true. Because it was so busy. And then, but watching you interact with my dog gave me great insight um, about how loving you How were. nice I can be? Not <laughs> nice. It was beyond that. Kind it was just animals. Not, and beyond <laughs> that. It was just like a deeper connection. And I think also too, you know, like going back again too, when you were sharing about the really emotional journey that you had with creating this book. I think that's going to be what resonates because you've gotten like crazy good press with this book. And there's something like the Black Sabbath cookie, you know, it's like the easy version, the shortcut press version is that it's your take on an Oreo cookie. And it's like, it's so much more than that. And it's like this book is so much more than the cookie book. And it's so Thank much you. more. I than, appreciate that because oh, I think so. Yeah. And it's <laughs> like you, the way you love dogs is so much more than like, it's just loving dogs. Well, you know? I think it's I mean, because I have, um, I'm socially inept. And so I can deal, I can relate to dogs way more than I can relate to people. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and which we appreciate, which we, yeah. but, and having said all that. No, I do love dogs. I do. I, I love them. And how I did you come up with the dog biscuit? Yeah. Um, not to both. Dog yeah. biscuit. Well, I, I, I knew that I had to have a dog biscuit in my rest, in my book because I wanted to have my dog in my book. Yeah. Which and I think so, is the healthiest cookie in the book, yeah. right? Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, for dogs. They're yeah. all No, I, right. there's some healthy cookies. In yeah. There. Um, <laughs> and at the time that I was writing the book, my dog had a stomach virus. Aww. And so I did some research and I figured out, like, some things that I could make for him that would make his stomach feel better. And um, oddly enough, when we were when we were testing the dog biscuit, there's a dog park around the around the corner from my restaurant, and we went to the dog park and we had all the dogs stand in line. <laughs> we gave each of them a dog biscuit, and we just wanted to make sure that they were they would pass. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. and they, the dogs liked them, but I I think dogs pretty much will eat anything. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh. Okay. Before we send it out to the audience, uh, we have got the very first. Chicago James Beard Awards coming up. Are you excited yes. as yeah. a James Beard Award winner? Are you yeah. excited by it? No, I'm, I, 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 yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to be no, presenting. I mean, I'm, no, I'm, yeah. I'm presenting this year. Yeah, I'm very excited. I mean, I think it'll be very nice. And we actually signed on for another two more years. So it's going to be here for a couple years. Oh, and nice. I, think it's, I think it's exciting to take the awards on the road. I mean, I think, of course, it is. Um, I think the awards are nice. It's a great... It's a great way to feel um, like to get recognized for your work. Um, it's really about raising money for the Beard Foundation, um, but it's it's just a weekend where chefs get together and have a good time, yeah, mm -hmm. and raise money for and, a good cause. Yeah. So I think that's great for scholarships and educational yeah. programs. Well, yeah. Well, we'd like to um, open it up to the audience if you guys have any questions, and I'm sure you do. All right, uh, we're gonna bring the mic around, so please um, just wait until the mic gets to you so we can hear, unless, well, I you're know her. Big, unless you're like a good loud talker and then I'm sure we can take it. Right over here. Uh, this is yeah. embarrassing, but I really wanna know why 
my chocolate chip cookies keep coming out so flat? Um, probably, and I, it's interesting that you're asking me this question. It's a perfect question, and it's great. And don't be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. But when I was on the road, because I just got back from going on, on uh, like book a book tour, tour um, I taught a class in Portland at this really great place called The Cakery, and a woman asked me the same question. And we were all talking about it as a group and trying to come up, and I was asking her all these questions, and it could be your sheep hand. Too thin? It or? could be your sheep hand. I don't know what you're using. What, what kind of sheep hand are you using? Change your sheet pan and put it put a thermometer in your oven, and change your recipe. Oh. <laughs> Why there might be a so, good recipe? Yeah. No, you might not have enough flour in your recipe. Too you much might, your leavening agents might be off. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it depends on the temperature of the butter. I mean, perfect temperature for malle malleable butter. The internal temperature is between 64 and 68 degrees. So check that and make sure that you're doing that. And you have a simple tip for people how to measure temperature. Just, uh, just put a thermometer in there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. I always do yeah. that. Exactly. All right. Next question. When people like, yeah. put on their lips. You're like, yeah. Yes, then, Lucy. You, you talk about loving malt and porters and things like that. Could you talk a little bit about beer pairings and cookies? Yeah. Sure. Oh. Um, well, um, I, I, as you know, um, am a lover of craft beer, and um, I actually don't drink beer anymore. Um, it does not agree with me, but I still bake with it, and we still cook with it. And I have found that porters, smoked porters, um, I found that stouts, milk stouts, I, I adore milk stout. I still drink milk stout, and I love sour beer. And I think sour beer is so great with fruit, um, obviously, duh. But um, so I make jam with lambic, and I make jam with frambois. And obviously, we talked about frambois. And um, milk stout, toffee, um, pecans, coffee, uh, malt. I mean, milk stout and milk chocolate and malt, like they were made for each other. So um, but your restaurant is one of the first places. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for recognizing that because everybody forgets. What, so, <laughs> it so, was so, so long Chaco ago. It was one of the first <clears throat> restaurants that would pair your I was, beer um, with your I, food and I your was dessert. I actually yeah. one of the first restaurants in Chicago that actually recognized craft beer as craft beer and actually said, you need, this is important mm -hmm. and you need to enjoy and pair this with this and this with that and think about it. So mm -hmm. we... We're one of the, we were actually one of the first restaurants. Your bartenders were very knowledgeable. Yeah. I was, even though I, I can drink like one thing and be drunk, yeah. I was sent as a Tribune reporter to go go on a bunch of dates and do beer pairings, and I went yeah. to Hot Chocolate, and oh, they paired this great porter with this chocolatey dessert. Uh -huh. It was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Bravo to your staff. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, we're, we're in, my, my husband's very into craft beer, too, so. I was just wondering, what are some of your favorite places to eat in Chicago when you go out? Um, I, yeah, I, I dread that question. Um, <laughs> dread it. Um, I, I do not go out as much as I used to. And I, but I will tell you something very funny because my husband and I lo love to cook at home. Um, and I'm also somehow always on a diet. But um, <laughs> I will tell you that my absolute favorite restaurant in Chicago, hands down, I don't even have to think about it, is Le Bouchon. Um, I feel like I am being transported back to Paris on my honeymoon, and I, I absolutely love the ambiance. I love the food. The wine program is so phenomenal, and it's a classic, and there's something about a classic that, to me, is way better than the, 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 the trendiest restaurant around. That's Damon and Armitage, right? Yeah, but I will tell you that I went to New York recently on my book tour, and I made reservations at a very, very, very trendy restaurant in New York, and going there thinking I was going to hate the restaurant, and I absolutely loved it. And name? It was, it, the name of the restaurant's Dirty French, hmm. and it was like this very, very trendy restaurant, and I absolutely got it. But I, I love, like, French bistro food, and I love, like, cassoulet and, um, you know. Poulet roti. Huh? Uh, Leonard salad. Yeah, I would love it. Mm -hmm. Just love it. Yeah, I do. So, you know, um, I, I'm a peasant food eater. Mm -hmm. 
And so, um, but I, you know, I go, we, 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 I love, you know, I'm, and I will plug it, but I think Parachute is absolutely one of the best restaurants wow. of its time for now and love it. So very creative, Korean inspired. It's fantastic. Yeah. Parachute. Yeah. Fantastic. So, interesting. Because the, the nostalgic the aspect certainly makes oh. sense, but the surprise. Oh, for her. For, so, oh, for sure. Okay. No, for, for you, Beverly. for the French. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hi. Oh, yeah. Um, thank you so much for being here. I really enjoy listening thank you. to your stories. And um, it just, it's, it's really inspirational to see a sort of multidimensional woman succeeding in a career. Thank you. Um, we didn't hear the KitchenAid story, and I wanted to know oh, the, the KitchenAid Kitchen story. I'm mm-hmm. a good, good one. Thank you. We thank you. Best um, audience. So I, um, I, I, so my, my mom gave me this kitchen, and I actually brought it to the restaurant. I brought it to the restaurant, and we used it so much that the motor burnt out. And I'm like, well, you know, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? I'm not going to throw this away. I mean, it means so much to me. So I put it in a box, and I put a box of cookies on top of the KitchenAid, and I put a note in, and I said, dear Mr. KitchenAid, <laughs> please <laughs> fix my motor. And I sent it to Michigan, and we're their Whirlpool, and... It came back and it was fixed. Aww. The cookies were not there. <laughs> yeah, it's a cute story, Who's and I still have it. I I don't have it at the restaurant anymore, but I have it. Well, I've been reading some of your recipes, and I was just wondering why you liked goat butter so much more than like regular butter. Oh, Excellent well, I don't question. like goat butter more than I like regular butter. Mm. But why do you use it? I do have goat butter. In the book, and I wanted to um, again when I was coming up with the recipes, I wanted to um, like have a variety of recipes, and I thought that goat butter would be a very fun alternative to using cow butter. Um, and one of the reasons why is because a very dear friend of mine, Bill Kim, um, who owns a couple of restaurants in Chicago, he I cannot like have dairy, and um, so I try to create things for him so that he can enjoy sweets. So, so he I can't really have a, came up how but he can have goat. Yeah. Oh. So I came up with that in the mindset of um, having my friend Bill can be happy. Mm. Well, but so I actually love goat butter and I think it's very it has a very interesting um, uh, flavor to it and I don't I don't like goat cheese which is crazy yeah. but I do like goat butter. What's the flavor like? It's just acidic and mm-hmm. it's earthy and mm-hmm. it when you when you bake cookies with goat butter they they smell differently and mm-hmm. they're just yeah. different. I mean yeah. and it's just an alternative. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you everybody. Yeah. Yeah. You can you can get your book signed by Mindy and hopefully she can answer more questions. Thank you Mindy Siegel. Thank you. Thank you.